warning. This episode contains strong language. I remember uh, very early on, like in 2003 or four, I interviewed um, uh, Rusty Yates, who, whose wife Andrea Yates had been convicted of murdering their uh, children. Um, uh, uh, and it was a very, very, very high profile case uh, in, te- in Texas, but, but you know, nationally. Um, and, you know, she had postpartum psychosis. She's still in a hospital to this day. But Rusty, at the, at the time when I interviewed him, had, had forgiven her. You know, I don't need it. It was a phone interview as well, which was crazy. Um, and I remember putting the phone down after this, you know, hour long interview and just bursting into tears. And I mean, yeah, of course, it, of course, it affects you. Welcome to the Lone Star Play Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Scott Armstrong. Join me and a famous guest. We discuss their career, life, food, Texas, and everything in between. Let's get started. Hi guys, and welcome to another episode of the Lone Star Play Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Scott Armstrong. Okay, we have a quite an interesting amazing podcast today my guest today is alex hannaford and he has a podcast called huddled masses and the first season was called dead man talking and whoo it's a true crime series okay those are super hot and popular right now so it's a true crime series he's a uh he's originally from uh london england Uh, i think he grew up in essex he said um, he moved to Austin, lived in Austin for about 16 years. Now he lives up in the Northeast of uh, America here. So while he was here, he's a writer. Uh, and while he was here, he investigated um, a series of murders. Okay. This is kind of dark to talk about. We've never talked about this on the podcast, but um, y- you know, and uh, the railroad killer, his name was Angel. And um, so the first season of, of his podcast, you know, again, it's called Huddled Masses, but the first season is called Dead Man Talking. So I know it's a little confusing. He even talks about that a little bit, you know, how because they started the podcast as Dead Man Talking. And then when it became so popular, they wanted to keep, uh, you know, a theme going and, and do seasons. So uh, they, they had came up with a, a more umbrella type name, if you will, right to for everything. So um, it's very interesting. So check out the other seasons as well. But the first season is really what we talk about here. So the Dead Man Talking and other people that he's talked to, other people in prison and uh, just crazy right I mean these are the things you you see in movies right the guy goes up he's in the glass they're both on the phone talking it, you know it gets crazy um you know I basically ask him too you know what are the emotions you're feeling when you're talking to these people whether it be over the phone or in person to seeing them you know it's got to be crazy talking to a serial killer or somebody right like that that's just committed some uh, heinous crime uh, and and trying to you know be professional and talk to them right and not let your emotions uh, you know come through uh, which is you know it's insane so we talk about that it, this is a great podcast it's really really cool so alex hannaford check out uh the podcast itself dead man talking um in fact you know you may want to stop this check that out first before you listen to the podcast i don't know uh and then um yeah check out huddled masses as well and alex hannaford you know online uh as well on, on all social media so uh and don't forget about our podcast go to the lone star plate.com you can check out everything about us there any past episodes things like that go youtube don't forget we we split up the podcast and do little clips on there so and that's where you can see us talking because we video this uh and you can see the person see me uh if you want to do it that way uh, and again, we just break it down into clips. So anyway, all right. I also want to congratulate Vice President Biden, who is now President-elect Joe Biden, and um, Senator Kamala Harris, who is now Vice President-elect Kamala Harris. So congratulations to them. Um, you went out there and voted. It's been a crazy election. It's over. Hopefully, soon. And um, yeah. So that's our civic duty. We went out and voted. Hopefully you did. If you didn't, that's your right to, I guess. <laughs> uh, but that's the election. It's been decided. And um, yeah, hopefully we can all try to, you know, come together and, uh, 
you know, be one, if you will. Um, look, I, I, I don't care who you voted for. Um, if you voted for Trump, you voted for Biden. I, I did vote vote for Biden, you know, just full disclosure. Uh, but look, if you voted for Trump, I, I you know, that's your right. I, I don't care. I, I'm I'm one of these I'm one of those people. I'm, I'm open to everybody. I, I just want to be friendly, move forward, be positive, come together as one. Uh, I'm tired of all the fighting. So, uh, you know, my philosophy moving forward, hopefully it's yours as well. is just to come together uh with you know everybody and and let and let's just be more friendly and unified and united right because we are the united states of america and i love this beautiful country and i want us to all stop fighting and and come together more so here's to that so let's get to this episode this is nothing political so this would be a good escape for you um and again these are all the 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 rage right uh true crime podcast so this is a really deep dive into that and and you get to hear from the 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 writer and the journalist who put this together behind it and um yeah it's great so anyway check it out here we go alex hannaford enjoy you know what? It actually it looks like you're on the set of of where Borat stayed in the middle of that <laughs> new movie. You know what I'm talking about? That like <laughs> I've not those... seen it yet. Actually, I've oh gosh, yet. oh my god, you got to see it. Uh, well, this, it, that, that, I'm not revealing anything. That's in the trailer where they show him like with the pan hitting like, uh-huh. the virus, hitting the coronavirus. <laughs> yeah. That's what it looks like. Anyway, uh, <laughs> well, listen, Alex, I'm I'm really excited to talk to you, man. I'm really glad Emmett, um, you know, put us together. So full disclosure for our listeners, Emmett, who helps with the show as well, is a, is a friend of Alex and suggested that uh, maybe we get him on the show. And yeah, once I looked into your podcast and everything, I was just like, oh, my God, what <laughs> is this? This is the craziest story. Uh, well, I'm happy ever. to be here. Thanks for having me. No, I appreciate, man. I'm from one podcaster to another. Um, you know, I appreciate you taking the time, man, because so, I know what uh, this does. So let's let's just jump into this, Alex, sure. um, a little bit. Um, you know, so l- let's talk about the the podcast. We'll just start there real quick. So it's called because it's not called Dead Man Talking. That was just the name of the first season, right? Yeah. So well, when we started it, it was it was Dead Man Talking, and it's kind of a bit confusing. We could go into you know. <laughs> The sort of po- podcast platforms and how they um, how they kind of delineate like second seasons if they if they're different to the to the first in sort of subject matter and how you then find you know what you're looking for it's it's all that's a whole another story but yeah so we did Dead Man Talking not re- not sort of knowing if there would be a second season of anything uh, and then we oh. decided to sort of do a kind of long form interview podcast series which is just ju- just finished actually uh, and we're about to kind of uh, go into another one so. Um, so Dead Man Talking was a sort of, you know, uh, a kind of investigative uh, series, which we can, you know, talk about. The second series uh, was called um, Battleground, which is just finished, which is all about the election. And the third season we're about to start recording is another criminal justice kind of long form interview piece about wrongful, wrongful conviction. So um, so what we decided with Audio Boom was to kind of come up with an umbrella term so we called it huddled masses which is sort of everything me and the producer pete do for audio boom is going to kind of go out on that that feed basically love it no i love the idea um you know yeah i I, trust me i know everything about the behind the scenes podcast stuff that happens (laughs) it's a it's a night we have a meeting every monday just to talk about this stuff we have to go over what's happening with this what's happening with that what's what's lisbon doing now what's What's this little weird contraption on the website or WordPress? We even had the founder of WordPress on the podcast, and we still <laughs> couldn't get problems solved on WordPress. We so- <laughs> like, guys, I can't do any more than that. That is literally the most, like, you know, experienced guy with WordPress on the planet. If he can't so, do it. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. If he can't do it, we, we can't do this. So, well, look, um, yeah, let's just jump into this. So, uh, so Dead Man Talking mm-hmm. was about a serial killer named Angel, which I find mm-hmm. fascinating. <laughs> um, right. Like, that's just this is crazy. I guess just take us where you think our listeners would best understand this so we can kind of get into yeah it. yeah yeah so um well a little bit of background on me so i i, I was a, a kind of music journalist and arts journalist in the uk i've been doing this a, a long long time and in 2003 i went freelance and kind of moved to texas i fell in love with austin actually covering south by south uh, south by southwest for many years and decided i want to kind of live there and, and then i met my now wife and you know it kind of made sense to go and spend oh, so a year she's there. american yeah she's, she's from american. dallas yeah yeah. And yeah. she went to UT, so which is in Austin. And so, um, you know, Austin was kind of a natural, natural home. Um, 
And I knew that when I moved and, and sort of was going to kind of try and make it as a print journalist it, it, abroad, that I would have to kind of widen my repertoire and not just write about music or art. So I, you know, an, an old editor uh, that I used to work with in London said to me, death row and the religious right are going to be your bread and butter. <laughs> and she was right. I mean, you know, within within a couple of weeks of it's kind of ironic that you know I, I actually made made my living and paid my rent. You know, going you, you know on the on the stories of these poor souls in in prison and stuff. And that kind of irony is not lost on me. But um, anyway, so you know, I put in a request to interview a few inmates on death row. Realized that the process back then was very straightforward, uh, unlike a lot of states in in America, in Texas ironically, considering its reputation, it's very straightforward and easy to interview uh, inmates. You, you just get the inmates permission, basically. You don't have to get the attorney's permission or the prison's permission, you know, unless there's some reason. So there's a lockdown in effect or whatever. Uh, the in, if the inmate says yes, you, you get the go ahead. So um, wow. there I was on death row, completely out of my depth, you know, this kind of former music features writer in London, uh, interviewing these notorious criminals. Um, on, that they, you know, it's Angel is the anglicized version. On Hell is what he called himself. Yeah. Um, okay. and, which and which he, means the same. It means which the means same the same thing. thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is kind of crazy, right? Because he was the, one of the worst sort of most notorious serial killers in American history. And he also, by the way, um, thought he was an avenging angel from God who was sort of sent down to kind of cleanse the world of sinners. So everyone he killed he said deserved it, even though it was, we can go into his sort of modus operandi, but it was completely at random. Um, so, you know, I, I, he wasn't the first person I interviewed on death row, but he was, you know, kind of one of the first, I think the third or fourth. Um, and you say so a bit out of my depth, I kind of, you know, just was asking these very open-ended questions, uh, you know, looking back, I don't think now 20 something years on, I would have, or what is it? 16, 17 years on, I would have asked the same sort, sorts of naive questions like how many more people did you kill? Can you tell me some details about that? You know, oh I probably God, would, yeah. have, would yeah. have asked him <laughs> specifics about the sort of minutiae of his case, which, you know, um, for whatever reason, you know, I did that and, and I wrote a little story for a magazine in London and, um, and then it sort of forgot about it. Um, and then, of course, you know, uh, asking him about these other cases, one of the, the cases that I asked him about, he, he told me that he had killed uh, a man in Houston called Daryl Colahaco, who um, two people, he said, were in prison for that crime. Now, you know, I talked about that in my story. I realized later on that the Associated Press had done something on this as well. So this wasn't kind of unique to, to my interview. Um, but nothing had been done about this, this pe these two people in prison. So they were still in prison for, uh, you know, ostensibly for this murder that, that this serial killer had committed. I did my bit. I wrote my story. I moved back to, to, to London uh, shortly after that. Um, you know, I've been back and forth across the pond a, a number of times over the last, you know, God knows how many years. Um, and sort of, you know, I felt like I, I, I told my story and, and did what I could have done and, and, and nothing happened. He was executed in 2007. And, um, you know, that was the next time I kind of thought about it and thought again about these people. I was writing, I started writing, by the way, to this woman, uh, Diamantina Colahaco, uh, in prison. She was in prison for organizing the murder of her husband, Daryl. Um, in I think oh, it was wow. 1998 and she had the prosecution had said that she had paid or sorry she had got her boyfriend then boyfriend or her lover Andres Mascaro to kill her husband for the life insurance money boy I feel like I've heard that story like yeah right? so, yeah this is this is a tried and tested uh, yeah. but that's so crazy God, yeah crazy. so so you know long story short uh, I moved back to the states in 2015 I found the cassette tape again of of this interview that I had done with Unhell and there again was his confession and I realized that these two people were still in prison so that's sort of the bare bones of 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 why we decided to do the podcast it was like a holy shit moment um, these people are still in prison for his crime the serial killer said he committed and really nothing has happened in the in the that's, intervening years yeah that's that's absolutely insane what a jump start what a way to get you <laughs> inspired right like uh, was uh -huh. that your idea too behind i mean that's the reason but was it also like we can help a little yeah. bit here 
For sure. I mean, you know, fast forward uh, however many years and, and you know, my, my kind of, you know, I was, I was no longer so out of my depth when it comes to sort of writing about criminal justice and stuff and, and, uh, and sort of my motivations for it as well, which had, had changed, I think. Um, you know, I, I couldn't believe that nothing had been done. I knew I wasn't the only person that had kind of mentioned this case, but I was writing to her on and off from England and she was sort of saying, you know, yeah, I don't know what's happening and nothing. It's happening with my case. I don't have an attorney. I can't afford one. I'm an indigent defendant. So uh, Pete Sale, who's a very good friend of mine and a podcast producer, had been a podcast producer for years, decided we would pitch this idea uh, where I could go back and kind of reinvestigate these confessions. And by the way, this wasn't the only confession, as you know, in the, in the podcast series. Uh, but it was kind of the one with the most jeopardy because there's two yeah. people serving a life sentence. They've been in prison for 20 years. So um, I'd never interviewed Diamantina in person or Andres. They had, I found out they'd never done a media interview. And really, you know, certainly in the case of Andres, like no one had really been visiting him for the last, you know, God knows how long. So, wow. um, so the first thing we did was put in requests to interview them in prison and, and got them, you know, granted and went and went and met them and um, just kind of went along this path it's interesting, actually, you're, you're a podcast man, too. Um, and I know we know that this is not the best way of, of doing an investigative podcast, but we would get email when we, when we launched the series, we would get Facebook messages or tweets from people saying, oh, this is so interesting. I can't wait to find out what happens. And we would sort of tweet back. I would tweet back saying, you and me both, we have no idea. And we were always working <laughs> maybe two podcasts ahead, but we had no idea how the series would end at all wow. we had absolutely no idea we had a a rough sketched out last episode which kind of <laughs> it was a bit bit kind of lame but it would sort of sum up oh this is the, what it says about the american justice system you know not really knowing what would what would happen <laughs> in this case um and and actually more happened than we could ever have hoped or imagined but um yeah god that's just crazy uh, what you know i'm wondering what what do you write to somebody to to ask them to let you interview them you know what? What are you putting in there? Well, I mean, with with um, keep it with short, Diamantina, sweet. Are you personal? Yeah, you, I mean, with her, I mean? we'd kind of we'd, we'd built up a bit of a, a rapport because I think we'd been writing to each other on and off for so long, and exchanged letters. So she knew that one day I wanted to kind of try and meet her in person, and it just you know she didn't even know what a podcast was because she was she'd been in prison for so long. She had no idea, no idea oh, how wow. you listen to them. Oh yeah. <laughs> Wow, that makes sense. I mean, that makes yeah, sense. didn't realize, didn't really know what she was kind of agreeing to, but but you know, knew it was a piece of journalism in some format. Um, yeah, uh, you know, knew knew that it, the public would would hear it, but you know, didn't didn't really know what was happening. Um, Andres had never written back to me. I'd written to him a number of times over the years, and he'd never written back to me. And it suddenly dawned on me that maybe I should write to him in Spanish. I don't speak Spanish, but I used Google Translate and sent him this letter. Oh, wow. and I got a letter Out back within <laughs> within two weeks. He'd written back to me. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. And it re I, I realized that, uh, you know, all those years when I'd sort of dropped him the occasional note, he, he'd been in prison for so long, but had never learned to speak English properly. Um, and, it, and it worked. And he, of course, agreed straight away and said, no one's, no one's cared about my case or, or you, you know, even been in touch with me for so long. But, um, of course, I'll talk to you. So, uh, wow. We, we so, so what's in the initial... I guess that's why I'm most curious, but what's in the initial correspondence? I mean, what do you say? Hi, how you doing? I'm Alex. I'm from, you know, like England. I, I want to talk to you. I'm just curious what. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just curious. You know. uh, well, with Diamantina, it was, you know, like I said, I, we'd kind of, we'd been talking on and off for so long, but with. Well, I guess the with, first talk, what, what, what is the first, yeah, like how well, do you initially with, contact them? Yeah. With, I mean, with, with Andres, it was, it was an initial, you know, I guess contact because he hadn't read my previous letters. So I said, you know, I just told him what I told you that I had interviewed Resendez back in 2003. I'd been following this, you know, I'd been concerned about his case for so long, thought something had kind of happened, realized it hadn't. Um, I'm now working on this podcast series, which is going to focus on their case. Um, could I come and interview you and find out about, you know, about this possible kind of wrongful conviction? And it was short. I mean, really very short and shortened to the point. Um, yeah. All I needed from him was a kind of acknowledgement that he would agree to the interview. And then actually what happens then is the prison take him the, the, the kind of formal request and he just has to sign it. So, you know, Got sometimes, you, you know, in the past I've, 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 I've applied to do interviews with people without contacting them first, just kind of knowing that their case was high profile and they probably, you know, knew that people would want to request an interview. But with him, I mean, it was so out of the blue, I think, that I wanted to kind of make an initial request and, and you know, 
let him know who I was, what I was doing, that this was the story I was working on. But yeah, kept it very short. And, you know, he wrote back immediately and said, of course, I'll talk, talk to you, you know, so. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, you know, I feel like you could write a book, you like how to interview a serial killer and really just <laughs> go through all the steps because you've been through all the the hard parts, right? You've learned all the lessons, you you know how to reach out, you know how to have, that would be a very, honestly a fascinating it's, it's pretty uh, nerve wracking. I mean, yeah. I was very nervous to begin with, but um, uh, when I um, first went on death row, of course, you know, I'm out of my depth and, and feeling like <laughs> a fish out of water. And, and, it, and then you very quickly realize that there's this, um, so I'm not religious, but this religious term there, but there, there, but for the grace of God go I, you know, I mean, you do kind of have that moment where you think I'm sitting in front. I remember this guy I, I interviewed who, was a little bit younger than me at the time and he'd been a university student and he'd been he was executed actually eventually for killing his girlfriend um but you know i just had this conversation with a very very articulate intelligent bloke and i just remember thinking god this is so weird like we could be on the outside just having a drink together talking this didn't feel you know i think that you if you have never been to a prison or never been to death row it's easy to kind of imagine these people as monsters and uh, I've been to death row more times than I honestly can remember um, and interviewed more people there than I can remember. And there was only ever one person that sort of gave me the chills. And actually it was someone I hadn't even interviewed. It was, I was, you walk along this bank of interview po uh, pods, basically secure cells and you're in the front and there's bulletproof glass and you talk to them by, via telephone. So you have a, there's, they're numbered, you know, so you when you go in the, uh, the, the public relations person will say, Oh, you're in, pod number 67 today and you just kind of walk along and, and there it is and your inmate comes out and sits the other side well, while I was walking along to do one of these interviews one of these days um, there was this guy sitting like on the ledge of the sea he wasn't even sitting in the seat he'd kind of popped himself up on the ledge of the cell and was kind of had his knees kind of up and his arms holding his knees and he was just stared at me as I walked across the room like wouldn't wouldn't stop staring at me and I knew immediately who it was it was a guy called Tommy Lynn Sells who was a serial killer in Texas around about the same time as Resendez and I knew I knew who it was immediately because he's very very recognizable and I re I literally I was like why is he looking at me you know he looked like he wanted to kill me um, oh so that was God. pretty that was pretty scary but Resendez was a five foot nothing uh overweight guy who spoke very softly and I really did think I remember thinking at the time we didn't need the bulletproof glass you know he's not going to be capable of doing anything I mean the reason he was able to kill so many people is because no one suspected uh, it you know he's very unlikely looking murderer and he surprised these people a lot of them were in the middle of you know it was the middle of the night they were sleeping or he just kind of you know crept up on them and then bludgeoned them with whatever blunt object he could find so it was the element of surprise with a lot of these murders plus he killed a lot of old people and yeah. people who couldn't kind of defend themselves so um but yeah i mean he wasn't frightening in any way shape or form uh, to look at um but but that's sort of what's maybe so frightening <laughs> <laughs> absolutely absolutely 100 percent. that's what's something behind right something behind there something behind those eyes yeah. something behind that demeanor that's, that's something not right um do you find that you find do you feel that you find something in common with all of these serial killers you talk to um i mean i've only interviewed you know um god serial murderers i probably interviewed like maybe two or three serial murderers but um that's more uh, than me <laughs> yeah, but but I've interviewed a lot of people who have have killed people, and yeah. you know you have to as a journalist you have to find <laughs> something in common. Otherwise, you you know they're not gonna. And and it's weird. I mean, I've read this from a lot of other journalists who talked about this as well. You have you can't be sort of judgmental when you're talking to them. So here's someone telling you about you know in Resendez's case describing the sort of minutiae of a murder, and I can't sort of sit there and go you're fucking insane you 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 monster you know you have to yeah. just say oh nod your head and 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 get them to wow. talk more about what you want them to talk about so it's it that's kind of odd uh but that's that goes with i mean a lot of the work i do with not just uh people in prison that have, have committed horrible crimes but you know anyone i don't agree with you know you have to you can't you can't disagree with them unless it's to elicit a particular response you know you want to kind of ask them a question about something um or get a response from them but yeah it's um it's weird sort of sitting there kind of 
with a sociopath going, (laughs) nodding your head in agreement. Yeah, I can't imagine. I mean, you're talking to somebody that's like taking the life from somebody, yeah. right? And, and in a couple of cases, multiple times. And yeah, that has to feel odd. Like we, we could be having a beer right right now, yeah. having the same conversation. But instead, we're in this maximum security prison. You're being held for all these horrible crimes. You're talking to me, seem like a normal guy, <laughs> brushes his teeth, you know, what watches National Geographic in the whatever in the, in the yeah. cafeteria with the rest of the guys. Yeah, it, it, it must be odd. And, and Texas being world famous for its prisons and death penalty, right? And, and, and that sort of thing. Did you have any sort of, you know, coming from England? Like, what, what are your thoughts? Like, did you really like, oh, gosh, the system is horrible. Like, I, you know, I hate the system. Uh, d- does that even affect your journalism in any way? I mean, I think that... Um... I think that when I went on death row to death row the first time I had this kind of, Oh, I always think back to 2003, I sort of maybe had this. Yeah. I asked myself, what, you know, do you believe in the death penalty? Do I agree with it? I think at the time I would say, I I think I would have said, you know, if something happened to a member of my family, um, then I would agree with it. Uh, But that very quickly changed actually when I realized, um, and I don't mind, I don't think as a journalist, I've thought about this a lot, actually, you know, can you, can you be a, a, an effective journalist and, and, and have an, uh, there, there is somebody, a guy called um, Mike Gratchik, who's the, who was the, I don't think if, I don't know if he still is, uh, the AP bureau chief um, for Texas. And he uh, witnessed a lot of executions, I think m- more than any other journalist and, and, and interviewed a lot of these inmates on, in, on death row. And I remember he would never, I interviewed him once, he would never say either way whether he agreed with the death penalty or not. And I think I very quickly realized that that was not something I was capable of doing as well. Um, I still think I can write a story um, that where, you know, I can sort of um, put both sides or if there are two sides to put um, and and be a fair and balanced journalist without you know, you necessarily knowing that I think this is abhorrent. And the reason I think it's yeah. abhorrent, the reason I disagree with the death penalty is because I've seen too many, I've, I've covered too many cases of, of not necessarily, um, we're not necessarily just talking about innocence here, but, but uh, unfair trials, trials where, you know, the, the defense attorney fell asleep or, you know, just failed to call certain witnesses or racial bias or, you know, I mean, it was only while I was, after I started covering the death penalty that the Supreme Court ruled that you couldn't, couldn't kill my, uh, people who were minors when they committed their crimes. That's no longer the law of the land in America, but it was when I started covering this stuff. Wow. Um, and there's an inherent, there's a massive racial bias and stuff. So I just don't think that the reason I think that I disagree with it is because it just can never be carried out um uh fairly yeah it, yeah, it, it can't yeah, the, the, right. you know um there's a, a friend of mine um will frankham who made a series of web uh films and the series is called one for ten you can check it out for free on on online but um and it comes to it's about the death penalty he interviewed people who had been freed from uh, death row uh with evidence of their innocence and the, the term one for ten the name he gave this project was referring to the fact that for every 10 people executed in America, one person is freed with evidence of their innocence. That's one in every 10. Wow. Which is shocking. That's Because then you think, and that's DNA evidence, of course. Now, you know, we're working on a, a case at the moment. Um, I'm, I'm kind of involved with, as a result of the podcast that we did, there's a, an organization called Proclaim Justice, who are fantastic uh, uh, innocence um, organization that, that pay for, you know, they raise money and pay for very, very good attorneys to kind of get involved in these wrongful conviction cases. And he, um, uh, they, um, sorry, I don't know, I just got a text message come through and now I don't know where, where I was going with that, but they, um, they, uh, um, sorry, I'm completely, are you, uh, don't, I'm, even what, it. Don't, don't even sweat it. Don't even sweat it. Uh, um, well, you were just talking about, um, you know, that, that interview, I guess, uh, or the death penalty there. Um. Yeah. Um, so that, that's right. Sorry. So as a result of the podcast, you know, we're looking for DNA evidence in the Colahaka case. And obviously that would be cut and dried if they found on her DNA at the crime scene. And we're, we're seeing if there is still evidence available to test, but you know, wow. here's the thing. If, it, if it's mm. not, if there's not, then there are other avenues to go down to prove a wrongful conviction. And that's kind of my point. So, you know, if, if, if 
the one for 10 statistic inv it involves kind of DNA. I don't know if it, if, it, if it necessarily does, but there are a lot of DNA exonerations. It's an easy way to exonerate somebody, but there are a lot of, there probably are a lot of other people on death row or serving life sentences who are innocent, who, where there's no DNA available to test. So, you know, how do you get them out? Maybe you don't. Yeah, that's absolutely. Yeah. That's the sad part, man. I mean, it's look, I've grown up in Texas. It's been a conversation here my whole life of the death penalty. And it's a, honestly, the state's pretty divided on it, to be frank yeah. with you. You would, th you would think, oh, all Texans are gung ho about just, you know, get, yeah, electrocuting anybody, right? Yeah. Like here, uh, but that's not the case, uh, to be honest with you. There's a lot of people that don't like it. Um, I've gone back and forth on it. I'm kind of like you, if it was more personal, I would probably be like, yep, that guy's gone. I'd probably do it myself, you know? It, it wouldn't even matter, death penalty or not, right? But just as a whole for society what do we need we we make too many mistakes right so for us to take that final step where you can't come back from a mistake i i think is a mistake yeah. you know so unless it's just something so abhorrent but again that that's what people get where then where's that line mm. right who who begins to draw that line of mm. of who deserves it and who doesn't and yeah it's a tough conversation right it is if it's not personal to you you're probably going to be more open to letting things just you know let, let's go through the system let's put them in mm -hmm. we don't really believe in prison reform in a sense and i'm not talking about criminal justice reform prison reform you know prisoner who mm -hmm. needs to be reformed to get back into society mm -hmm. we talk about it here a lot like we want to do it or this or that or it's you know you'll see it on the news or a show and they'll do a cool little montage of of prisoners in some work, work program or something. But the reality is we're about putting people in, locking them away, turning off the lights and throwing away the key. And when they get out, we could care less about them. And that's a horrible system to me because they're your neighbors. They're your coworker. They're, you know, they're not going away. And, mm. and I think, I think we just have a bad system with that. When we get people in, we don't work on trying to make them a better person when they get out. Right. And there's, there's also this sort of sense of, um, you know, closure, that, which I've never kind of bought into. But this idea that if you if someone is executed, it gives closure to the victim's families. And I'm not sure that it ever does. I'm not sure it, it, it doesn't bring anyone back. But obviously, but I mean, you know, does it give closure? No, I don't you know. think so. I, I mean, maybe you'll find a few people, right, that would say that. But I yeah. think you're right. I think the people, the families would say, well, my family member didn't come back. So what yeah. what did it actually change? What did it achieve? Yeah. yeah. What, that what person no do? longer doesn't, if they were guilty, doesn't have to think about the crime anymore. Exactly. And, you know. Yeah, that's a good point. That's kind of releasing them of the yeah. crime in a way. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, never thought about it that way. Yeah. Yeah, but that's true. That is true. Yeah, it's got to be fascinating to, to talk to these people. Do you ever find your real emotion, like, you know... Do you ever find yourself getting emotional when you're talking to them sometimes? I know you said, you know, you're a journalist, you got to keep professional, you're, you're trying not to let that, but has it ever happened? Or, yeah, 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 of course. You know. No, I mean, I, I'm, I, you know, I'm, I, we're, um, so there's a couple of things, sort of thoughts on that. I think, um, yes, the answer, short answer is yes, um, a number of times. I remember uh, very early on, like in 2003 or four, I interviewed um, uh, Rusty Yates, who, whose wife, Andrea Yates, had been convicted of murdering their uh, children. Um, uh, uh, and it was a very, very, very high profile case, uh, in tech in Texas, but, but, you know, nationally, um, and, you know, she had postpartum psychosis. She's still in a hospital to this day, but Rusty at the, at the time when I interviewed him had, had forgiven her, you know, I don't need it. It was a phone interview as well, which was crazy. Um, and I remember putting the phone down after this, you know, hour long interview and just bursting into tears. And I mean, yeah, of course, it, of course it affects you. And I think that um, I'm involved with an a organization called the DART Center, D-A-R-T, which is an a organization set up, which sort of uh, it's, it's, it, it's, it's there to kind of deal with uh, journalism and trauma. So it, it serves two purposes. So the first is journalists who cover trauma how can you be a better journalist at understanding trauma and its impact uh before you interview these people you know you should have a very deep understanding of trauma and how it works and all the rest of it so you can become a better more ethical reporter and then the second sort of kind of half of their remit if you like is uh journalists who kind of get traumatized themselves doing their work so war correspondents but also 
writing or making programs or audio uh, programs about um, child abuse or whatever it may be. So uh, they're a really good organization. They have loads of resources online and stuff. And I've been, I've been involved with them for a long time, but um, you know, I, I think that, I think that they've been very helpful as well. Like, you know, but, but I think I'm the sort of person that I, c- I can get emotional about stuff and in interviews. I mean, you, you can't fail to kind of get, em- get emotional when someone's telling you this about the worst thing that's ever happened to them or, or whatever. Um, and, you know, it's just, you have to kind of, I remember doing some interviews for two interviews I did for the latest podcast season, which is about the election. Um, uh, battleground. I got choked up on two occasions as, as people were telling me their uh, stories. Um, the latest one is the last, the last episode we did is, is to do with the evangelical church. And we, I interviewed this woman, Lindsay Kane, who was a, um, a, a, a quite a famous Christian singer songwriter. Um, and she had everything. She had this sort of, you know, big recording um, deal and, and or, or, you know, sort of recording life and touring and, and uh, lots of fans and all the rest of it in this world that was Christian singer songwriter, this Christian singer songwriter world. And she came out um, and she realized that she was gay and she kind of she lost everything. She lost uh you know she'd have tours cancelled she'd have death wow. threats all the rest of it but yeah no so i you know i got i got choked up talking to her about her case and what happened to her and um like i said that's an election podcast because we we divided that into two it was her story and then she talked about the evangelical vote uh, yeah. and and why evangelical christians are voting for trump which is fascinating um so yeah that that i i i still to the i've never i've never not been able to sort of get get kind of emotionally involved in in an interview i can't make apologies for that really i can't can't stop myself kind of and i just take a beat and take a pause and and then kind of uh we carry on you know absolutely no i get it um i I would be i look i wear my emotions on my sleeve there's just no way i could do it um i would be i would be my face would be reacting to everything (laughs) they're telling me i would be you know it would just be would just not be good for me um well, that that is absolutely fascinating. Um, I, I'm curious, real quick, uh, did that yeah. woman? I'm curious, um, is she voting for Trump? That woman you just talked Lindsay, about, Lindsay? No, no, no. Well, no, no. I'm not. pretty sure she's not. She. So uh, okay. actually, well, you can listen to the episode, but but her story actually there was a a, a big turnaround. I mean, she still identifies, I think, as a Christian, but certainly in a much more um, uh, embracing church. She's very, very, um, uh, uh, you know proudly out she's she actually um she kind of made national news this during the pandemic because she married her uh, girlfriend in a in a, a, a movie theater in austin um oh sorry it was an outdoor it was an outdoor movie like a drive-in movie and so all the guests kind of turned up in their cars and stayed in their cars i might have saw that. she got married yeah it was on like yeah. people magazine covered it in the today show and we talk a bit about that in the in the thing but but yeah so, so she's very happy she's got uh, two kiddies and um, you know, family that love her and all the rest of it. So, you know, there was definitely a happy ending for Lindsay, but she's, she's, um, she's no longer in that sort of evangelical Christian world. But she can talk about, you know, talk about it. She has definitely some insight into it. Sure. I mean, I have a good friend. Uh, he's actually, he's been on the podcast, um, Case Erickson, shout out to him. He's got a phenomenal story of same, same sort of deal where he was married mm-hmm. Um, you know, with two kids, married to a woman with two kids. Mm. And then one day decided that that just wasn't for him. And, you know, so he came out, he divorced, but, you know, came out as gay and he's very um, religious, very Christian. Mm. And he's got these great thoughts and ideas on how you can, you know, and I agree with him, right. It's like, you can be godly. And because this is the South, right. This Mm. is the South, the Bible belt. And there's just, that has definitely been ingrained in people here. I mean, they have, um i don't even what do they call gay therapy camps here in texas they're in texas here they literally exist like a basket and robins where you can get ice cream you can you can take your kid for ice cream and then take them to get them ungayed that's what they call it like ungaying them it's like what what are you this it's insane it's Lindsay had to go yeah she was talking about that she had to go through that as well um oh crazy but of course realized that she is who she is and she's yes would just be kind of yes Hundred percent. Yeah, it kills me, man. That kills me about the South. It kills me about Texas a lot, to be honest with you. Um, it's a very right. It could be hard a little bit. It, I mean, Austin is very liberal, so it's you, you could be in a bubble here. 
to be yeah. honest with you, um, and not know what the rest of Texas is like. Uh, I grew up in Dallas, so mm-hmm. your wife your wife will know Dallas and Austin are, are much different uh, in, in a lot of ways, um, in, in good ways. I, I love everything about it. Uh, but yeah, that, that's definitely interesting. Do you want to talk? Is it okay if we talk a little bit of politics? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, yeah. We'll, we'll just do like the last part of it here. Um, you know, the election's coming up. But obviously, um, just disclosure, th- this will come out after the election. Yeah. Yeah. Just FYI. So, we're, you know, as we're talking, the elections already happen. Mm-hmm. Yay, Biden. I'm hoping I'm just that's <laughs> what I'm hoping is happening. Biden has won. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Should we record two versions where <laughs> yeah. Trump, yeah. Trump has won and you Biden have has won? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's just apocalyptic <laughs> behind us if Trump is one. We just got like, you know, fires and, and stuff going on. Um, yeah. So I'm curious. Um, first of all, your thoughts as an out, you know, are you a citizen? Can you vote? Yeah, Here? Okay. So you're a citizen. Boom. You're American. OK, so, yeah. What do you think? Uh, hit us. Hit us with it, Alex. You know, we so well, I can talk a bit about the 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 um, I mean, number one, I think it's um, it, I'm just uh, I'm, I'm kind of astounded. I think America is one of the few countries in the kind of um in the in in the sort of western world that uh where you don't autom you're not automatically registered to vote so like in in a lot of countries you know you you they'll you're you're automatically registered to vote so you don't have to kind of opt in it's like it's it's there it's there for you so you you know so texas as you know i mean i think this election is going to be different but it's crazy how many people don't vote in Texas, generally speaking. I mean, in the past, I think it's one of the lowest voter turnouts of any state. Um, and they don't make it easy for you. And that's probably why. Um, yeah. But, but you know, I mean, we have the same problem in the UK with the sort of, you feel like it's a two-party system. We have three major parties, but I mean, really, really only two. <laughs> Um, yeah. and it's, it's the same here. So, I mean, I'm hearing a lot from people who are saying there needs to be, there needs to be more parties or whatever, but, um, but you know, this, the podcast that we just made battleground, which as you said, we're, we're, we're going to be talking about this, uh, and this, this podcast, your podcast will go out after the election. So, but battleground, you know, we just aired our last episode, but the idea behind it was that you sort of acknowledging the fact that this election is a referendum on Trump. There's no doubt about it. Um, but there are still these issues that we need to talk about because, you know, if he gets back in, they're suddenly going to be front and center again. It was a referendum on Trump, but, you know, LGBTQ issues, um, Black Lives Matter, uh, you know, guns, the climate crisis, uh, immigration. These are all big, big electoral issues that, um, that you know, of course, people are concerned about. But I think more people are talking about Trump's electability and, and Trump versus Biden than they are about the, the, the issues. So what we did was take uh, an issue per episode, eight episodes. And some of these should never be electoral issues. The first episode we did was on the pandemic. I mean, why the hell is that an electoral issue? But it is. And it's, dev- it's just as divisive, crazily. So we talked to a guy called Dr. Craig Spencer, who's an ER doctor in New York, um, and, you know, about, about why this has become politicized and, and, you know, from a, from a medical standpoint, like, what are we, what, what does he think about all this? Um, and so, um, you know, I think that diving into these, we, we had one person per episode. So it was a long form interview podcast. So we just, you know, I just interview one person per episode to kind of talk about the issues around that, that particular subject and stuff. And, and it really is pretty eye opening. I mean, the guns one, for example, um, we interviewed a guy, this is a very Texas kind of Texas themed episode because uh, he was um, instrumental in the campus carry bill becoming law. Yeah. So uh, campus carry, which allows um, uh, gun license holders to carry their weapons on campus. And it was very, very controversial. Yeah. Um, and uh, he basically, um, as I said, was kind of instrumental in, in bringing that uh, about uh, his name's Scott Lewis, and he he was legislative director te- for Texas for students for concealed carry on campus. But he sort of moderated his views over the years since then, which is crazy. I mean, this guy, I, w- I found myself in the podcast interview trying to be try- trying to challenge him a lot, on a lot of things, and his responses just had me nodding in agreement. You know, it, yeah. it was very very sensible um, in what he said, made made a lot of sense, and and. 
I, you know, I said, Scott, you're just not the person you were. And he's, he agrees he's not. He's moderated his views. He actually emailed me when I asked him to do the interview. He emailed me back and said, I'm probably not who you want to talk to because I've my views have changed a lot on what we talked about all those years ago. And I said, no, you're exactly the person yeah. I need to talk to. Um, because, Absolutely. you know, he still believes in the right to bear arms. I mean, let me be very clear, but he's, uh, his views are we need to be, we need, we need safe uh, legislation to keep, to keep, guns out the hand of kids hands of kids and and to be to be safe um yeah absolutely so that so yeah so all all of the so i think that there are you know lots of issues here that you from my native england that just don't don't you know aren't big issues over there um yeah uh and you know we don't have a supreme court that's threatening the right to for for same-sex couples to marry um and it's stuff like that is kind of frightening that just uh, you know uh, a vote can change change that you know that that what is the law of the land could be in jeopardy a woman's right to choose could be in jeopardy um so you know it's it's definitely i definitely you know went uh, it's very difficult sometimes for somebody that's lived in the states for so long to sort of distance myself a bit but i still feel you know i i am this sort of brit kind of living over here and i can kind of look at it a bit more dispassionately even though i am an american citizen and have the right to vote now um, I still try to do that. I think I try to do that with a lot of the work that I do uh, as well. I think it kind of, um, I don't know if I think of my audience as being British back home and me telling them about this. Somebody asked me this the other day, actually, but I think for this podcast, I know that we have a lot of American listeners as well. So I sort of hope that maybe they'll get something from it too. Oh, absolutely. Of course. Well, your perspective is interesting. Um, you, you're actually going to have a more nuanced perspective than somebody that's only grown up in the system, to be mm -hmm. honest with you. You can compare it and you can contrast. You know, I like that. I, I would enjoy talking. When I lived in Europe, I loved talking to people about that. I loved, you know, conversing and learning and, uh -huh. and, and finding that out. So, yeah, no, that's interesting. Um, so what do you think about what do you think are some of the biggest issues that you haven't talked about on the podcast that maybe you wish you would have talked about or, you know, I, well, guess, I mean, I, I think guess it won't uh, happen look, for the third season. So, no, I think, I think the economy was, was probably the biggest kind of uh, missing piece of the pie, but it's very, you know, it's, it, I, I felt like because of the format that we were doing, which was, you know, dividing, I think dividing the episodes into two. So you have one person, but the first half is sort of talking about their story, which sets yeah. them up as a kind of, why are we talking to them? And then the second half is talking about the election. I think that the economy, it, it, it didn't really fit. The subject didn't fit, but obviously it's like, you know, number one for a lot of people, but it was just, how do you do that? How do you make that compelling? And, and a lot of people do, but I just didn't think it fit into our format for bat battleground. But, um, so yeah, that that probably I probably would have would have done something on that if we'd have had if we'd have had nine episodes, then I think the economy would have been in there. Yeah, I mean, wow. Okay, yeah. I mean, the economy is uh, especially right now. It's it's on everybody's mind uh, for sure, right? It's um, we're we're pushing through Supreme Court uh, nominations without offering any relief to all of America that's uh, suffering right now, which yeah. is yeah, uh, super super you know tragic. Mm -hmm. Has the pandemic affected the podcast or any interview, you know, anything you're doing? Yeah, for sure. I mean, we, you know, we would, I, I would love to have done um, another investigative series. Um, but with that sort of the ideas that I have for those are kind of on hold until it's safer to travel. We were going to do an, a series on the border, uh, but would have involved um, uh, me taking a trip along the border uh, with Mexico, which I've done before, but I wanted to do again for the podcast series. So, we're kind of going to do that next year. Um, so that will be actually probably after the wrongful conviction uh, series, the next one will be on the border. Um, wow. As long as it's, you know, safe to travel. We, I mean, who knows? Um, sure. But we, we want to make sure. So, yeah, we've been like you, we've been kind of doing interviews remotely. And I think it's, uh, you know, they for the most part, it's worked out. We've, people are recording their in their audio, their end, and, and and Pete's doing a great job of of mixing it all together and making it sound good. But yeah, it's a bit. It's 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 not as. Uh, I mean, it's not as fun as a journalist. It's like it's great to get out and meet people. So sure. that's never. It's never as as much fun kind of doing it um, on Zoom. But you know. Yeah. Have you ever wanted to be like you know bulletproof vest? Throw me in the in the shit <laughs> as we call it. Like, have you ever? Has that ever been on your mind? Like bullets whizzing by? You're like, yeah, let's get out there. Let's do this. 
Yeah, I mean, I've always said, I've always said, I, I spent my early childhood in um, Nigeria, and um, not that it's a it's a war zone at all, but like if I wasn't married with a kid, uh, then I'd probably be, um, yeah, sort of covering conflicts and stuff. Um, certainly, I think I'd be, I'd probably. I'd probably, honestly, in another life, I'd probably be based in West Africa, kind of reporting on stories there because it's a it's a subject that's really close to my heart and sure. a place that I love and um, all the rest of it. But I do go there. I go to Nigeria as as, as often as I can. I actually was there last summer, um, but uh, but not as often as I'd like. <laughs> oh man, that's crazy. I, well, first of all, two things. One, I think it's so cool that you can go to Africa so easily right there in Europe. Um, I love when I lived in Spain and Granada specifically, we could go to Morocco yeah. and be bam, we were right in Africa. I just remember thinking, this is crazy. I love <laughs> this. I love this so much. I mean, I just yeah. loved it so much. Um, you know, and the second thing, I, this is a weird question, I guess. Um, do you think some war journalist, you know, get into it, you know, I don't want to say the wrong reasons, but like, the, you know, this adrenaline junkie. So mm -hmm. they're not necessarily there to make a difference or necessarily even care about what's going mm -hmm. on. But there's just something just so, you know, adrenaline about being in those situations that, uh, you know, or yeah, are they sure. developed? Absolutely. They, yeah, they, yeah. They get to that point or? hundred percent. There are definitely people that that get into it for the wrong reasons or kind of want to make a name for themselves because they, I mean, you know, I went to see a, a talk in London a, a number of years back um, uh, by a, uh, a, uh, famous journalist in England called Christina Lamb, who writes for the Sunday Times. And she um, was talking about, she's covered conflict, many conflicts over a number of years. And, and she was talking about how she thinks um, women make better war correspondents because uh, men, um, generally speaking, are sort of obsessed with kind of munitions and the type of, they're kind of experts in, in you know, the type of, uh, the type of weapons used and the type of munitions used. Whereas women, you know, uh, generally speaking, will go and interview the families impacted and what are the women doing and how are they coping and what are the kids doing, you know, and so they humanize conflict and, and, um, and the result is much more powerful journalism. And I think she's right. I, absolutely that definitely sounds like who wants to hear who cares what kind of caliber <laughs> weapons are in the damn gun right like that's such a yeah God, that's so crazy uh no i agree with uh well i think more women need to be in positions of leadership uh all across the board to be frank with you um i was raised by women a lot so i just always had that mentality uh mm -hmm. they just know what to do they know what what's going to happen uh you know make it better make it safer for us so uh well that that's so fascinating about you know your job and what you do man this this is absolutely you know just crazy um you get travel around i'm sorry that the pandemic is sort of <laughs> but what, what what's the what's the i know you said um you're going to start um recording season three right so are you just waiting for the election to happen are you doing anything special for the election like no election? no I just sat at home gonna watch it watch it from home i voted last night um early voted um but yeah we're we're about to start recording actually later this week the first uh ep i don't know if it'll be the first episode but the first interview for um we're, we're working title is the innocent um but it's to do with wrongful conviction and kind of what happens when you're uh released uh, do you feel free? And, you know, what, what does freedom look like? In a lot of cases, um, uh, uh, you, people who are, who, you know, there's technical kind of things where you can be free technically, but you, you still sort of are officially a, a convicted. And so, you know, there's, there's people that we're going to be interviewing who talk about the impact of that on their, their psyche and stuff, knowing that they're sort of physically free, but maybe not mentally free. And, and, you know, what does kind of, being readmitted to the free world look like and, and all the rest of it. And, and, you know, how can this happen? You know, how can somebody be in prison or on death row for so long? Um, how can there be these catastrophic mistakes that are made? Um, so we're kind of looking at that, but again, it's all through story. So we're, you know, it's an, it's a single person interview for eight episodes um, and it's really trying to kind of, it, they're long, long interview like this one, you know, it's a long yeah. interview and we're kind of going to get, into the weeds and and um really get them to get them to tell their story oh that's awesome no they're it's a great podcast man great production too that's one of the first things that i noticed too oh pete production. will be happy <laughs> big yeah, shout production. out to pete. <laughs> yeah big shout out pete because look i i actually edit our podcast uh, uh -huh. coincidentally enough I, we have a lot of people that work on it, but i'm i just i do the editing not yeah. that i particularly 
want to do that but uh emmett actually is has been a godsend to me man that guy has helped me so much with understanding technology and mm. how to edit better and sound and this and that and whatever because i'm a chef man i come from <laughs> physical you know i want it in my hand and you know i, I can slice a tomato and, and mm-hmm. cook you a steak <laughs> and and that that sort of thing uh, but yeah it's it's been it's it's a diff that's a difficult part of the podcast uh so i don't think it gets uh, talked about enough. So yeah, definitely big shout out to Pete there. Um, great job on that. Well, Alex, I won't take up too much of your time, man. I, I just really appreciate this conversation, man. It's been absolutely fascinating. Thanks for having me. I, yeah, it was good to talk to you as well, Patrick. Thank you. Yeah, I'm really excited for season three. That's a uh, that's actually a subject pretty dear to my heart, to be honest with you. I'm, I'm a big believer of, of you know, I talked about it before, right? I, I think those, I think people need deserve a second chance. And I think the way we look at some people who've made mistakes is just it's not the right way. And coming from Texas, uh, that's definitely a big issue here. So I'm really excited that you're behind these issues and you're behind these things. Um, honestly, just hearing you talk, it really made me think about making a murderer. Yeah. That Netflix show. It really made me think about that a lot. I'm just thinking, yeah, this is the kind of this stuff does happen. I mean, of course, all the other police, uh, you know, justices that happen. Mm-hmm. But yeah, these things do happen, man. And it's absolutely insane. So you're fighting the good fight. We appreciate <laughs> it. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely, Alex. All right, brother. Well, my best to you and your family. And Thank you. um, Godspeed. And you guys be safe out there. Thanks a lot. Take All care. Right, brother. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. The Lone Star Play podcast is produced by Texas Real Food. Go to texasrealfood.com and you can search your city for stores, butchers, restaurants, farmers markets, and more who are using fresh, artisanal organic sources it's a fun site that brings all natural options all together i hope you enjoyed this episode for more information go to the lonestarplay.com i'm your host patrick scott armstrong until next time mm-hmm.